Welcome. It is Lucian, the man of mystery and danger. Yeah, danger too. <laughs> oh, well, let's see. What are we supposed to be doing? Oh, we're reading. That's right. It's Saturday. I've had a glass of wine. It was Taco Saturday here. So you guys just have to forgive me a little bit. Let's get ready. Oh, there we go. Look at that. All right, shall I catch you up? Remember, we ended chapter 22. Dwayne drank to the toast and thought to himself for the second time that day that he was the luckiest man on the planet. Outside the military, it was rare for someone to get the opportunity to spend time with a person who has just saved their life. The nature of emergency situations didn't usually allow for that sort of interaction to work out. However, bonding over post-fight-or-flight hormone highs went back as far as humans sitting around a fire eating the bounty of a hunt. It was enjoyable and cathartic to share the moment with those who went through the ordeal. It's even better when you really like that person. Dwayne concluded to himself. Even after everything he'd been through today, he smiled. Outside the boat, the moon rose behind them. The moon dance sparkled as her namesake shone down over the Atlantic Ocean, screaming by at 125 knots. And that was the end of chapter 22. Now it's time for 23. Ready? Here we go. Clock is away. Chapter 23. T minus 42 hours, 25 minutes. Location. Airport at Chichen Itza, Yucatan. Date. December 19th, 2012 AD. Local time. 5.41 PM. Global reference time. 23.41 GMT. You're lying. Maudie say laughed out loud when she said this. Sitting in the jump seat closest to the captain's chair where Maudie say sat was the helicopter pilot. He was smiling, but quiet. There's no way your name is Pilot. You're lying. She sat back and sipped from her Patron this time. She could feel herself getting way too tipsy. And the sun had just gone down. She still had a long flight ahead. Before she could think about that, the pilot finished a shot of his own expensive tequila and answered her. Nope, that's my name. Honest to God. Jacinto couldn't help himself. He chimed in from his seat next to Marise, which was fully reclined now. Okay, what's your first name? And don't say helicopter. Everyone cracked up at this. They were all in the cabin of the helicopter which was parked next to the large private hangar at the Chichen Itza International Airport. The cabin was so large and well-appointed, there was no reason to go inside and wait. At the request of Jacinto, Zappa had been replaced by the Black Eyed Peas, and the pilot joined them after shutting down the aircraft. Now, after running non-stop for 20 minutes, the air conditioning system had gotten the cabin nice and chilly. The pilot got up and grabbed a blanket for Marise and one for Jacinto. Then he slipped on an old leather bomber jacket as he sat in the jump seat again. Nah, my first name is James. Jim to my friends. He smiled at Marise again. Marise saw and returned his grin. In the back of her mind, she suddenly thought, What is it with pilots? Do they teach them how to do that handsome, devil-may-care smile in flight school? Before she let herself get giddy, she looked away and passed Jim Pilot to the runway outside. Then she looked at her watch. They arrived ten minutes before JL's plane was supposed to be here. Now the plane was ten minutes late. The sun set about twenty minutes ago, but there was still no sign or word from JL's plane. The tower would not give out any information for security reasons, not even to the helicopter pilot. So they decided to relax and enjoy the amenities that JL had provided. 
Finally, she regained her composure and looked back at the pilot. I still don't believe you. There's no way your parents named you Jim Pilot, and you grew up to be a pilot. Helicopter pilot only. Don't do the fixed wing, just the whirly birds. His voice had a sing-song effect to it, and he smiled that same grin, but it was not as effective this time. He was clearly flirting with her, however, and she didn't seem to mind. The strange physical excitement of the day and the glow of the tequila were beginning to mix. The result was a very strong body buzz that Marise did not find unpleasant in the least. Okay, Jim Pilot, the helicopter pilot, prove it. Show me some ID, big fella. She kept smiling as he stood up. Jim kept smiling as he stood up. At six foot three inches, he had to stoop his head. When he reached around his standard issue Air Force leather flight jacket and pulled out a wallet of his pulled a wallet out of his pants pocket. He flipped it open and pulled out his Farnsworth Industry ID card. See? It says, Jim Pilot. Matisse took the card from him and looked at it closely. She almost missed it. Then she looked at the pilot with a smirk. No, it says Jim Pelote. I almost missed a little bitty eye at the end. Nice try, smarty pants. Then she handed his card back to him. Jim shrugged his shoulders as he put his wallet in his flight jacket. I always thought that was just a typographical mistake. Jacinto and Matisse laughed out loud at this. Just then, the radio in the cockpit crackled to life. Jim excused himself and headed forward. After he closed the small door to the cockpit behind himself, Jacinto sat up. Damn, girl! Just throw yourself at him. It'll be more subtle. Marise swung her right arm out and popped Jacinto in the shoulder. He winced immediately. Ow! He grabbed his arm and put his seat in the upright position. It's okay, I get it. You've been out here in the jungle for a while. So the first suave, debonair helicopter pilot that happens to be named Pilot, and you're all gooey. Marise reached back to hit him again, but she stopped when the door to the cockpit opened and Jim came back in. All right, that was a jet. They're on final approach now. They'll be on the ground in a minute or so, and they should be pulling up outside in front of the hangar when they stop. Marise and Jacinto both jumped up at this, and a few minutes later, they were all outside in the equatorial night air of the Yucatan with their luggage and the pelican case in a neat pile beside the skid of the helicopter. When they looked across the tarmac, they saw the Gulf Stream aircraft as it pulled up in front of the hangar door about 20 meters away. Marise couldn't help herself and looked at her watch again. Fifteen minutes late. That's more like the JL I remember. She said this out loud, but no one heard her over the sound of the Gulf Stream engines. Suddenly, the engine noise dropped as the twin jet turbines wound down. Marise turned and grabbed the Pelican case with the artifact as Jacinto grabbed both bags. Then, the three of them strode over to the plane. As they approached the custom jet, the door swung down and extended into a ramp. Just as the ramp locked in place, a figure moved to the doorway inside the plane. Marise, Jacinto, and Jim arrived at the bottom of the stairs at the same moment J.L. popped his head out of the door. Surprise! J.L. put on a big grin, and then he slid down the handrails onto the tarmac. They were surprised all right. All of them had their jaws hanging open slightly. Marise still had a little tequila buzz, but she managed to speak first. What? Are you doing here? I thought you were going to meet us in Miami. J.L. walked directly up to Marise and firmly grabbed her by both shoulders. Can't a man drop in to see his wife if he wants to? Then he smiled that big smile again. Jim looked at Marise with honest surprise and shock. You're married to him? Jacinto instantly lost his buzz and looked at Marise. You're married, boss? Marise looked from Jim to Jacinto and then back to J.L. He never stopped smiling. She snapped. What? You pro- you sa- you son of a bitch! J.L. still had his hands on her shoulders. He started to say something, but when he did, 
He lifted his hands up and made a move that looked a little too much like the oops gesture. That was more than Marise could take. Faster than anyone could react, she pulled her arm back and swung around with a hook that landed directly on JL's chin. His huge grin instantly disappeared from his face as JL's head snapped up and to the side. It was almost in slow motion as his eyes rolled back into his head and he collapsed in a heap at the bottom of the Gulfstream stairs. From behind her, she suddenly heard Jacinto. Well, there goes a trip to Miami. It's back to the jungle for sure now. Marise spun around and pointed her finger at her assistant. To hell with that. You heard him. I'm his wife. That means half this plane is mine. You two pick him up and get him on board. I'm going to Miami tonight on this plane. At that, she grabbed the pelican case and stepped over JL's unconscious body. Then she stomped up the stairs and into the private luxury jet. Jacinto and Jim watched as she stormed off and then looked at each other at the same instant. Then they both cracked up laughing as they walked up and gathered the unconscious multi-billionaire off the tarmac. Jim looked at Jacinto as they started to carry him up the stairs. You work for her, huh? Jim shook his head and whistled. Looks like you may be working for her too, Jacinto retorted. They both laughed even harder as they dragged JL on board. And that was the end of chapter 23. Now on to chapter 24. Things are happening fast now. It's close to the end. Chapter 24, T-minus, 42 hours, 7 minutes. Location, aboard JL's jet. Date, December 19th, 2012 AD. Local time, 5.59 p.m. Global reference time, 23.59 GMT. The large, customized jet shot down the runway and lifted off into the night sky. Under both bags in the luggage closet, in front of the main cabin of the luxury jet, the case holding the god in the clear rock was securely strapped down. Inside the case, the god in the clear rock slowly began to awaken from her long sleep. When Marise and Jacinto had opened the case inside the pyramid, they had pointed the LED light from their stin lamps onto the artifact. Every photon that had hit the surface of the clear crystal rock was captured and absorbed into the crystalline structure. When enough had been collected to create the minimum charge needed to signal the deep couple circuits in the nanocapacitor storage modules, the self-diagnostic subroutines began. Even though the light was dim and only on for a few minutes, enough energy had been transferred to give the God in the clear rock the awareness that she was awakening and to initiate the self-protection protocols. When the quantum equivalent of subconsciousness was triggered after successful pre-diagnostics, it sensed the presence of Marise right before she put the artifact into the pelican case. Then, when she took the case onto the plaza, the god in the clear rock also sensed the sun. Even through the thick plastic of the pelican case and the solid mahogany box, the god in the clear rock could sense the presence of life-giving sunshine. Then, at the subconscious suggestion of the god in the clear rock, Marise opened the case and the direct sunlight poured into the crystal tablet in a very literal sense. As with the dim LED stin lamps, every photon from the sunshine hitting her surface was absorbed, where it propagated an overunity production of energy, which was then stored inside her deep charge nanocapacitor system. It was an agonizingly brief amount of time before the case was shut again, but it was enough 
to rouse the God in the clear rock from her five century slumber. The God in the clear rock did not know where she was. She was not even fully awake yet, but she knew she was moving. And although she was not yet fully conscious, the God in the clear rock had one unclouded thought. It is beginning again. And that's where we're going to stop because the prologue, which is the last chapter in the book, I know the prologue is supposed to come at the beginning, but this prologue comes at the end. And that's the last chapter of the book, and it requires some special effects that I don't have set up yet. So tomorrow night, nope, tomorrow Sunday. So Monday, nope, that's holiday. Yes, I'll do it on Monday. (laughs) The next reading is the beginning of the last chapter, and it's a very special chapter. So I will see you guys the next time, and let's see, where are we? Yes, I will bring back Lucian, the man of mystery and danger. (laughs) And I will see you guys on the next show, whenever that is. You guys just let me know. Nobody's written me a note and said whether or not you like the man of mystery cloud with the missing source. (laughs) I'll see you guys tomorrow or whenever. Just the facts, ma'am. Tonight's show was brought to you by Curious Lucian. He's the good Lucian. <laughs>